You heard it there, it's on video. Favorite youth pastor, thanks PC. Sorry, Pastor Zach. Forever ingrained in the archives, but. Hey, I'm super excited to be with you this morning. Honored to be able to preach what God has laid on my heart. I'm excited, 9.30 over there. Excited to have you guys as well, tuning in, anyone online. Uh, Before I get into uh, the scripture for today, just wanna challenge you, as you guys know, more than anyone, and we're so thankful for it, but New Hope is built Uh, It's a church that's not a building, it's not pastors, it's you, it's us, it's people. And to make, as our ministries kind of get back uh, and opening more opportunities, we need as many volunteers as we can get. So many of you already volunteer and we're so thankful for that. But we're kind of making a push that, to challenge you, if you would attend one and then serve one, or serve one and then attend one. That's what really makes this church so strong. When I travel to other churches or talk to other uh, or pastors and just they ask the DNA of New Hope, I get to brag on you guys all the time about how faithful you are in serving. But if you haven't gotten plugged in yet, that won't just benefit people around you, but I know God will use it to grow you and your relationship with him and your giftings and passions that he's given you. So we challenge you, attend one, serve one in this next season. So if you haven't heard, my wife and I are having a baby boy. Baby boy, yes. Praise the Lord. If it were my wife Jenna, if it were her, uh, like if she could plan it, uh, she would have four boys. I told her, you are insane. I grew up with two other brothers of mine and uh, we're just lucky to be alive. I have all my, I have both legs, both my arms, I got, everything's working. So she's crazy, but she wants all boys. But. Part of me coming to, I'm from Minnesota, part of me coming down to Des Moines, uh, real passion and um, really more than a passion, a call of God in my life was to come here and change some people into Vikings fans, to save some people, (laughs) spread truth in love, and I realize I'm doing a terrible job at it. I'm absolutely failing at that calling from God, so I'm gonna take a different approach and I'm gonna start making Vikings fans in my family, planting them here. And so some people are telling me, well, he's Iowan, he's born Iowan. I'm like, well, he's gonna be a Vikings fan, so he's still gonna be a Minnesota Gopher fan. So poor poor kid, (laughs) poor poor kid. But anyways, I'm super happy to be here. Are you guys happy to be in church this morning? Excited for what God has, yes. So this morning, continuing our series in Joshua, uh, I have the privilege of talking about not just the stories, one of the stories in Joshua's mighty hero, but really a hero of faith that is listed in scripture. I'm talking about Rahab this morning. She's a shero for us this morning, not just a hero. And so turn with me in Joshua chapter two, starting verse one. It says, then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them to go scout the land on the other side of the Jordan, especially around Jericho. So two, the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But some told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out our land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men, who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, uh, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I didn't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hid them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan. As soon as the king's men left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up to the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you along the Red Sea, or in the Red Sea, when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Shehan and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan. 
those are whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you'll be kind to me and my family since I've helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you'll let me live along with my father and mother, brother and sisters and their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep your promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through a window. Escape to the hill country, she told them, hide there for three days from the men searching from you. When, then when they have returned, you can go on your way. Let's pray. Jesus, we just invite you into this space, into the service, and into our hearts and our minds. We thank you for how you're going to encourage us this morning and challenge us, but ultimately meet us here. And that brings true change in us. We thank you for that. We tune into what you have in your holy name. And everybody said, amen. So, Jericho was a big fortified city in the promised land. It was a key place to take. The Israelites had been promised this Canaanite land. And Jericho was in the way. So Joshua sends out the spies meet up with Rahab, she shields them, saves them. Joshua then comes back with the army. We know they walk and they march and shout around Jericho. The walls come crumbling down and God gets the victory and Rahab and her whole family get saved. And, um, but Rahab, she's an interesting character, an interesting hero, if you will. So she was Canaanite. She was, which was an enemy, if you will, of the Israelites, an enemy of God. They were the people group that had occupied what God had promised. She was right in the way. She was also a notorious prostitute. We see that the very first verse she was listed in, her sin and what she was dealing with and what she did came even before we meet her name and experience who she is. She is listed a total of 10 times in scripture, even in the New Testament, and almost all of those times, she is listed as Rahab the harlot, Rahab the prostitute. Even if you know this story or talked or done a Bible study, we refer to Rahab as the prostitute. It's Rahab the prostitute, we just, that's what we call her. She makes in verse nine through 11, makes this powerful statement of faith, declaring this is God's land, I've heard, we have heard what God has done and his faithfulness to Israel. And I know that God is supreme, not just over heaven, but of earth. She makes this powerful faith statement before these spies. And so obviously then she hides them and helps them escape and she was saved. I always thought, even in Sunday school and growing up, that she was saved because she decided to hide the spies. By her actions, she was saved. But if you look at when she's mentioned in Hebrews and James, they talk about how she believed before the spies got there. She was already in a faithful, believing relationship with God who the rest of the people feared before the spies, before this opportunity to carry out action. In Hebrews 11, verse 31, it says, it was by faith that Rahab the prostitute, come on, Rahab the prostitute, even in the New Testament, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had been given a friendly welcome to the spies. James 2, 25, Rahab the prostitute. Come on, James, give a girl some slack. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown shown to be right. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. She wasn't made to be right, she was shown to be right by her actions. She had already come into a faith in God. She put her whole family and her life on the line by choosing this. She didn't do that to get into a faith with God, she did that because she believed in God, because she stood on the foundation that God was supreme, like she said. God is in charge. 
And it, her, her faith was what saved her, not her actions. And that's true for us today. Our actions don't and won't and can't save you. They can never save you by how you act. But your actions show how that you have been saved. Those actions of faith showed by Rahab displayed and put on display what she was already believing in her heart and her mind. It just was showing what she believed, that her faith was real, that it was the real deal. I love how Rahab talks about how she heard about God and God's faithfulness. The whole city is in fear. They're all talking about this God and how faithful and how powerful he's been to the Israelites. We don't even want to fight. We don't even want to fight. I love this because she was the only believer in the city. That's what it says. Whether that's just her or maybe her family unit, they were the only or she was the only one in the whole city and yet the whole city was talking about God's power and his faithfulness. And she herself says, I believed because we heard. Who did she hear from? She heard from the very unbelievers in the city. These unbelievers, these enemies of God were being witnesses without even realizing it. She believed because she heard. There is power in talking about what God has done and what he is doing. His faithfulness, his mighty power. And that's what led Rahab into believing these people were witnesses. What, is, what does that even mean anyways? The Bible talks about be a witness, need to witness to people. It's kind of a Christianese word that we kind of throw around and expect to know what it means tangibly. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Acts 22, for you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and what you have heard. Acts 4, Peter and John have been ministering. They got arrested. They're being on trial in front of the Pharisees, and they're being accused. And Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot Stop telling about everything we have seen and we have heard. They were witnesses. Break it down, what does being a witness mean? Being a witness means I have witnessed, I have seen what God has done and how he's moved and then I share it. I share it, I'm a witness to events that have happened. But the purpose of a witness, of being a witness is to see and then to share, it's a dual purpose. Think about in a courtroom when you bring in a witness, if a witness comes in, their job isn't just the fact that they've seen something, their job is to share something. Because if we were to just stop at just seeing what God has done, maybe even being a part of what God has done and stop at not sharing it, we're no longer a witness, we're just a spectator. And God hasn't called us to be spectators. He's called us to be witnesses that I see, I'm a part of, and then I share. That's my purpose. That's what I need to do. I wouldn't be a good witness if I don't share, if I don't talk, if I don't use my voice. I think the contrast, maybe even the comparison between some of the unbelievers in Jericho, sadly, is that unfortunately I see a lot of people in church that these Canaanites from Jericho who didn't believe in God were better witnesses of God's power and his faithfulness than we are. In our families, in our workplaces, we find it so scary, sometimes so hard to be a witness, to witness to people. Take all the pressure off you, just talk about what God has done in your life. Talk about his faithfulness. We need to be better witnesses. I'm a history buff. I love random old stories. In fact, I I just love that. In high school, uh, I got the award for Mr. History in high school. That may have played a part in. I was a super brown noser, uh, but I did what I needed to do, okay? Mr. History. 
But I love those old stories. I, I loved learning about history and what, you know, just the craziness and the, it just was, it, it always fascinated me. I loved, you know, early 1900s, I loved learning about the Model T coming out and what was, what was that about and, and, and the roaring 20s and that culture, what it must have looked like, felt like, been like to live in. Even the Great Depression, can you, you know, I, I just have no context there. Like, I love hearing about that. My great, great grandpa lived to be 103. He was born in 1900. Can you imagine the life that he lived? 1900 to 2003. The changes that that man saw, not just in the country, but the world, technology, I, I, it just blows my mind. But when, before he passed, we, we would get opportunities. He was sharp till the day he passed. Sharp to the day he passed. And we would go and we'd sit down with him and be like, Grandpa, tell us about this. And he would sit down and he would tell me about his first Model T when he bought it. I can't remember, some ridiculously low price. And he told me how he crashed it with his buddies. They were like 13. <laughs> and he crashed it and bent the wheels in and they couldn't move it, so his buddies just picked it up and they carried it to the mechanic. Like crazy, he talked to me about living in the roaring 20s and the culture and the, just the energy, the lifestyle. He talked to me about him and his family going through the Great Depression. I can't even imagine. And those stories, sitting there listening to him talk in first-hand account of how those, thi those things would just come alive to me it was no longer just real in a history book, it was real to me. When you are a witness, you're not just talking about how God is real, you're talking about how God is real to you. People can connect with that. It becomes alive. It becomes, it, it, it just, it unfolds. I know somebody, like if I talk about my mom being healed miraculously from cancer, that's different than sharing a Bible. Like, you know, like it comes alive for people. It's so different than just, not just reading about something. And so witnessing and sharing the goodness and the faithfulness of what God has done in your life, in your family, generations past, what he has for your future. There's power in that. There's so much power in that. People don't need to be preached at. People don't need to be persuaded. They just need to be told the goodness of God. They just need to hear. In Romans 10, 17, it says, so faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. Like I said, I will make witnessing as simple as possible for you. Just start talking about how God has been good to you, what he has done in your life, how he has changed you. I have the, just the awesome opportunity it's gonna look a little different this year with COVID, but I get to go and chaperone lunches at Urbandale High School. And they just let me go and hang out and talk with kids. And I'll ask students, and I'll say, what, what's the best thing that's ever happened to you? And they'll tell me some weird and crazy stories of whatever, you know, of their long 15 years of life. And then naturally they always ask back, well, what about you? And I say, well, let me tell you, and I don't make it cheesy, it's not some Christianese, I'm not manipulative, but the best thing that has happened to me is God changed me. I was addicted to drugs, I was, I, was, I was straight up an alcoholic in college, I was depressed, I tried to commit suicide. That's the best thing that's ever happened to me when God met me, everything changed. And to see these students go, huh, it's real for you, it's not just some old, stale building. You know what I'm saying? Like it comes alive when we talk about what God is doing. He's real, he's alive, and he wants to work in people's lives. And people can come to faith in him by talking about the good news, talking about what Jesus has done and done for me. That's how Rahab came to a faith. There was not one Israelite, not one Christian, it was unbelievers. Think of, think of the media flood, the social media flood, Think of our coworkers, think of your families. If we just started more and more just talking about what God is doing and what he's done. Do you see how that could change things? How that could change people? You don't have to come up with the perfect sermon, the perfect verse, the perfect, st just talk about how God is real and he's real to you. That changes people and it takes all the pressure off you.
because you just get to boast about what God has done and, in his, and put confidence in him. See, when Jesus would heal or, or save someone, many times in scripture we see him specifically telling that person, hey, go back to your town and tell them. Go back to those towns, go back to your people and tell them what I've done. Testify what the Lord has done for you. And then specifically it says, then the town was saved. The whole town came to know Jesus. We make witnessing way too hard. We make it way too complicated. We make it way too scary. If God is real for you, we could talk about him. We could talk about his goodness, his faithfulness, because it's unending. It's unending what he has done for us. I love it. And on the reverse side of it, we see multiple times that a whole generation of Israelites stopped believing and serving in God because they stopped talking about it. They missed a whole generation. Talk about, it. be a witness. I love this story of Rahab, and, and to me, the best part of this story isn't the story itself, but it, it's what comes after. Rahab's faith and that saving faith in Jesus and how God saved her, it started something that impacted the world. She had a son named Boaz. Have you heard of Boaz before? All the ladies are like, I'm waiting for my Boaz. <laughs> you hear that? Boaz is the model dude. There's a widow and, and, and he comes in and he's the family redeemer as is a, just a picture of Jesus. So selfless, kind, generous, marries this woman he didn't need to. Beautiful example of character. But he was the son of a prostitute. Rahab the prostitute. You go, you keep going down more kids and we meet up with King David, the man after God's own heart. King David, no Rahab, no King David. And all that he did for Israel and the kingdom and for God. He had a son named Solomon, wisest man to have ever lived, gave us Proverbs. No Rahab. No Solomon. What she did by just stepping and how God used her impacted millions of people through her lineage. But I love it, it doesn't just stop there. You, you turn the pages to Matthew chapter one, we get introduced to a genealogy that starts with Abraham and goes to Jesus and who is in the middle of it? Our girl Rahab. And it's beautiful because it's not Rahab the prostitute this time. It's Rahab, mama to Boaz, eventually leading to the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? That how God has used her? And I, I, to me, God wouldn't, if God was ashamed of who she was, he wouldn't put her in his genealogy. He wouldn't put her in scripture like that, directly linking her to the son of God. If God was ashamed of who she was, the prostitute, he wouldn't have used her like that. She wouldn't be linked to so many people. We see in Hebrews that she is matched up and compared to Enoch, who literally had such an amazing relationship with God that God said, nope, you're not even gonna die. I'm just gonna take you right now because I wanna be closer to you. Abraham, Moses, uh, uh, Gideon, David, like I said, she is like the patriarchs of the faith. She is listed right there with in confidence. Yeah, they throw maybe a little shade at her and call Rahab the prostitute at faith, but <laughs> who she was, what she had done, her past, it couldn't be stopped when it was in God's hands. It could not be stopped. I love 1 Corinthians. It says, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose the despised things of the world, the prostitutes of the world, the sinners of the world, things counted as nothing 
and use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit. God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you wanna boast, boast only in the Lord. When I witness, I don't have to just witness about the faithfulness of God. I can witness, I can boast in my weakness, as Paul says. I can boast because even though I have a past, I was broken, I've gone through stuff, I fall, I'm a sinner, I fear, I doubt, God still wants to use me. And God can use me. See, the more broken, the more glory to God. The more weak, the more power God gets to show. I love that unconditional love the Bible talks about. Really means whatever condition it finds me in, it still loves me. Whether I'm a prostitute, or a saint. I am loved by God, and God wants to use me. So many times in our lives, and even in my own life, we we define who we are, our identities, on what we've done, of what we've been through, on our struggle, on our weakness, on our mental health. We, We define who we are. We're like the New Testament writers that every time Rahab shows up, it's Rahab the prostitute. That's who she is. That's just who she was, the harlot. God saw her more than that. He saw what he could use. He saw that by faith he could change millions. And he was proud of her. But sometimes we think we are our sin. And if I am my sin, I couldn't be valuable to God. I couldn't be useful to God. I couldn't be, I'm worthless. Worship team, you can come. I have. $50 $50 bill here. This is what Pastor Weaver's paying me to preach this morning. I'm just kidding. <laughs> He'll give me the other 50 if I don't preach heresy, so help me, Lord. I got a $50 bill. It's worth $50. You can buy $50 worth of things. You can buy $50 worth of Taco Bell. I ain't, I'm not going to judge you. Whatever you want, 50 bucks, right? It's got a stamp and a seal of our government. But if I crumpled this thing up into a ball, would you still want it? Yeah. If I stomped on it on the ground, threw it on, and I stomped on it, and I slid it around, would you still want it? It's a little dirty. If, uh, if I swallowed it whole and was able to miraculously throw it back up in front of you, would you still want it? Some of you are like, nah, I'm out. I tell you, a whole room of high schoolers that would still pick that up and put it right in their pocket and use it that night, they'd still want it. No matter what has been purchased with this $50, no matter how this $50 has been used in the past, it's still $50. In fact, I could rip this in half and bring it to the bank and they would still give me a new 50. The value doesn't change because it has a seal and a stamp on it that has set its value. The people who created it set its value and that value does not change no matter what has happened or how it's been used. You see where I'm going with this? Your creator has set your value. No matter what you've been used for, no matter what you've been done, no matter whose hands you've gone through, no matter how many times you've been stepped on, no matter how many times you've fallen, you've been sinned, no matter how dirty, how ugly, how ripped or broken, your value stays the same. And that was proven on the cross. See, God looked at Jesus, then he looked at you and said, it's worth it. I value them. Jesus, if you could put a price tag on Jesus' life, it's the same as yours. Jesus' life for yours. That's what value is. And that, that can never be changed. That can never be altered because his name is written all over you. See, our value is not determined by those who set the price. But value is determined by those who choose to pay it. And Jesus and God said, I'm all in. They're worth it. I want to pay that. They are worth it. Jesus in exchange for you. Nothing 
you can go through, fall into, mess up, can change your value in Jesus Christ. Rahab's value wasn't changed and she was the lowest of the low in an enemy nation in a horrible, shameful line of work. And God said, I, I see you for your value. I can use you. I can use you. Our identity isn't based on who we are, but who we belong to. It's not based on what we do, but it's based on what Jesus did. And I know that God put Rahab on display throughout the Bible and even made her related to his perfect son because he wanted to set the example that he can use and wants to use anyone. Anyone, because it gives him glory. See, God got the glory of this story because Rahab only brought weakness to the table. She brought two things to God, sin and surrender. He said, God, I'm yours. I'm going to be obedient. Even this cost me my life and my family. And God's grace was sufficient for Rahab. God's grace was sufficient for Paul, and his grace is sufficient for you today. All we need is just to surrender like Rahab, no matter what we're bringing to the table, no matter how ugly it may look or feel. God wants to use you, and he loves you. See, God doesn't need your strength. He needs your surrender. Would you stand with me all across this room? I know there's some of us in this place that you have a history. Maybe that history is yesterday. Maybe some people have spoken things over you, over your life that you have so gravitated to and held on to. And you have walked around not living out your value because of maybe what you look like or what you've done. God wants to use you. And you know what? He knows that you're going to mess up in the future. But he set the value. And he can use us greater, more powerfully, more efficiently than we can ever. So would you bow your heads across this place? As the Holy Spirit ministers to your heart right now, I just pray that you you would be wrapped in his loving arms. That you would listen to his voice and what God says about you how he has set your value, that if you were the only person on this earth, he would die for you again. Thank you, Jesus, for that grace. And if you're in this room and you just would say that, I have not been living to my value that God has said, I haven't been focusing, I've been believing other things, I've been focusing on what I've done, or who I think I am, or what people have said about me, And I'm changing that this morning. I'm letting God determine and set my value. That's you. Would you just raise your hand? I can pray with you. Yes. I see your hand. Absolutely. I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. And if there is anyone else in this place that would say, I want to give my whole life. I know my whole value is in Jesus alone, and I haven't been living for him. And I want to, I want to declare this morning, like Rahab, that I believe in God. I want to give my whole life to Him. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Absolutely. I see your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to worship in just a moment, and I'm going to pray to close, and we're just going to give. I just want to give a moment for the Holy Spirit as we worship, just to minister to your heart. If there's things that have been spoken over you that you believed from Satan, I want you just to speak those out and give God your heart and let him speak what he says about you which is truth Jesus we invite you in this place we thank you for that perfect sacrifice that covers all of our sins covers our past covers our present covers our future we thank you Jesus that you love us so much you value us God and because you value us so much you want to use us bigger than ourselves God you want to use us to be a light you want to use us to be a witness to bring other people and help other people realize the value that they have in you God I thank you for the change not just a mindset but of heart this morning that we can start walking in how you see us not even how we see ourselves. Thank you, God, for ministering to hearts and minds this morning. We love you, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Let's just worship for just one moment. 
God, let us never forget our worth and our value in you. Our past doesn't define us. You do, Jesus. God, I thank you for the courage and the boldness that comes from knowing our worth and our value in you, that the pressure is not on us to have strength, to have perfection, to, to, to bring really anything to the table, God. We cannot add to you. But we just give you our hearts. We give you our hands. We give you our lives to be used. Help us to be powerful witnesses of what you've done and what you're doing and what you're going to do, God. Thank you for wanting to use us, broken vessels. Thank you, God. We praise you, Jesus. If you're thankful this morning that God wants to use you and he redeemed you and he loved you, would you just give him a clap of praise? Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you. Yes. Love it. Well, when I run into you in the cookie aisle at Hy-Vee, I better see you walk in with a little bit more swagger and confidence in who God has called you and how he values you and your worth. We're so excited for tonight. Baptisms happening at Raccoon River at three. Feel free to join us and celebrate new life in Jesus. Talk about being a witness. And then tonight, Sunday night service starting back up. We love you, church. Have a blessed day. Go Vikings.